Coming up on Time's Up. Refugee students share about the challenges they faced when moving to Canada. We learn how to reduce waste in our community and understand the importance of recycling. Why should we recycle? Because it's easy. Anyone and everyone can do it. And we skate over to the Skateable program. I think I've realized how much the kids teach me and how much the coaches come from all different backgrounds and they teach me. This and more right now on Time's Up. Welcome to Time's Up. I'm your host, Rudy Netrin. And in this show, we'll be learning about the different social issues our community is facing and meeting people who are standing up against those issues. Our first topic is about newcomers coming to Canada. Arriving to this country is probably the most exciting experience for them. However, they still deal with challenges and barriers as they make Canada their new home. And I was able to talk to a few students who are refugees and hear their story. Teachers? They're used a lot. Um, as you moved to Canada, what was going through your thoughts? Well, when I came to Canada, it was actually a little bit scary because I came by myself. I had no friends and I didn't speak English. But at the same time, I was really excited because um, I was looking forward to, to succeed. As we finally got on that plane and we were on our way here, saying goodbye to our family in the airport, the tears that came after that, thinking of like saying goodbye to them forever and to think of like what might happen to them the time that I'm gone. I was really excited and really terrified at the same time because I'm going to be starting new life, making new friends um, and meeting whole other new people. And you can see here this is the marking rubric, how they judge you. Mm -hmm. Could you explain some of the challenges they are facing when it comes to the Canadian education system? The first thing is they just want to fit in like any other teenager and that's the thing that's the coolest is that you look at them you don't see refugee you just see a kid <laughs> but sometimes because of their limits in language obviously the fitting in is harder if they don't have command of English yet even though they're the new people here um, they have to take the first step which is nerve-wracking for them we should really push into telling them what activities they can get involved in before getting to school and get involved there the friends that I have were all because I got involved in different things different activities and it, it just made like my life here so much better. We try to do a lot of promotion, helping the other kids in the building know, yeah, there are these newcomers and they do want to get to know you and they do feel lonely and isolated at times. So there's, there's the awareness piece and then there's the action piece. If I know a little more about you and you know a little more about me, then we are less likely to judge each other and more likely to work together and be friends, which is, I, I feel it's life. Our next story is about Marn Bauman, who's experienced mental illness in his life and shares why it is important to not face it alone. My name is Martin Bauman. I'm the communication specialist at CMHA Waterloo Wellington. You said uh, that you've been through mental illness before in your life, and could you share how it kind of actually started? Yeah, so it goes back for me to the time that I was 10. I was in the basement uh, having a sleepover with a friend of mine, and uh, you know, I hear my, my mom's footsteps come down and she tells me the news that my cousin is missing. And it ends up that uh, we lost him. And so uh, to see that was a big wake-up call for me, to see uh, the grief that a family goes through. You think somebody is doing okay, but uh, there can be a whole lot more going on beneath the surface. And uh, I think that's definitely something that's been the case for me in my life. My value uh, was based on what somebody else would tell me, whether I mattered. And you know, I was at a low because of that. I, um, I wasn't getting the help that I needed and, and I was keeping it to myself. Hello, Self-Help and Peer Support Guelph. This is Megan. We provide peer support groups and recovery groups for folks who are dealing with mental health or addiction challenges. What is your opinion on when they should seek help? as soon as they feel they need it. One of the strengths of self-help and peer support is that we're ready when people are. So uh, there's no waiting list, no fees to participate and no pre-registration. So people can just walk in and start getting the support that they are looking for. 
and uh, you can have a look at it when you get a chance. Everyone who works or volunteers at self-help and peer support has their own lived experience with mental health or addiction. So we take a, a fellow traveler approach that's very much about companionship, support, non-judgment, um, and helping people to feel less alone. This is a chance for us to keep it going, uh, to realize that yes, we've made progress, but uh, there is so much more that we can still do. And so to realize that, uh, that the work isn't done. If you yourself are struggling or someone you know is struggling, and especially if you're in crisis, please call here 24-7. And you're welcome to stop in anytime or give us a call and we're happy to support you. Time's Up, we'll be right back after this. Coming up next on Time's Up, we meet with some people who stand up for LGBTQ rights. And we visit some adorable friends and learn why animals deserve a loving home. And if there's something going on with that animal, then there's something usually going on within the home. Many trans people in Ontario have avoided public spaces because they are feared of harassment or being outed as trans. I met with some people who have been standing up for the rights of LGBTQ community and hear their insights on how to help reduce discrimination. I am not, do I look gay? And I was like, Tonight I'm hosting Shade, uh, another comedy show for queer comics, LGBTQ comics, and uh, comics who identify as women. Thank you so much. Are you guys ready for your next act? The LGBTQ community is still being discriminated against because I think everyone's perception of that is like, oh, they've got their rights now. Like, they're getting married and they have their parade, so like, what more do they want? And I think it, it goes further than that. There's microaggressions, there's still systematic racism, there's still things that the LGBTQ community goes through, um, and uh, this is just the beginning. get close to you, I wanna rock with you, take a walk. Kitchener Waterloo is pretty conservative and we like to think because of the industry that is really innovative that also the city is, but socially it's quite conservative. So for example with Rainbow Reels, just trying to find a venue for our super gay cabaret and people are like, oh no, giving us excuses and we know that they're, they could book us. So Plan B Co-op is a non-profit queer community project by queers for queers. And a lot of the stuff that we do is um, about centering tangible resources to queer and trans people in our community. The reason for Shade is because it's a voice for marginalized comedians and it's a space for marginalized comedians. Um, and I don't know if I would say it contributed directly to the rights. <laughs> That's a huge statement. Um, but it definitely gives us a space where we can be ourselves and be comfortable and have our voices heard. To me, I use storytelling as a tool to build bridges between people so that we can just understand each other as humans. And I find that's a better way to learn about each other. And that's the best way to break the barriers between us, whether that's all kinds of systemic oppression or prejudices that we have. Supports a lot of people who don't get support anywhere else. And Kitchener-Waterloo has a very strong history of being incredibly transphobic and anti-trans towards a lot of different people. And even if you are a support service centering um, uh, LGBT rights, it doesn't mean that trans people are at the forefront or even at the table. So taking on small tasks like that where you can actually create an impact, I think is the best way to create change locally. According to the Ontario SPCA, nearly 16,000 animal cruelty complaints occur each year. There's a way to reduce this number and help animals receive the love and care that they need. I am a dog groomer, a dog trainer, and I help run um, a boarding and daycare. So you have a lot of pets I see. What are their names? Uh, so my cat's name is Monster. My dog's name is Baloo, uh, Portia, and Timber. From the way that they acted when I got them, I feel fairly confident that something happened. Blue, um, I rescued him from the Humane Society. He was lifeless, basically. He just seemed really sad. So um, you could just tell that he had been taken in too many times, people not caring, and then just giving up on him. Portia, she was terrified of loud noises. And even still now to this day, she's terrified of beer bottles. She won't go anywhere near them. Um, even if we're holding them, she'll come to us, but you can tell she's very uncomfortable with that situation. Monster, he, 
he was just a stray little kitten. So he unfortunately um, just suffers now with a, a respiratory issue. Um, so he got, has a constant CPI and needs regular medication. A lot of the cases that we deal with are abandonment, uh, no one caring for them. Um, so we do attend and ultimately remove these animals. We also deal with a lot of um, animals in cars in the warm weather or dogs outside with no shelter in the winter. So how can the community help out with this? The community can call us. You know, they, they may think it's just an animal, but we look beyond it being just an animal. This is an animal that feels, has emotions, feels pain, just like you and I. And if there's something going on with that animal, then there's something usually going on within the home. There's just so many animals that haven't experienced love and to know what a real proper home is. It's fantastic to give them another chance at life and to see what there is out there for them. They can call the Kitchener Waterloo Humane Society or they can contact 310 SPCA and speak to any of the receptionists. They'll direct them where they need to go and they will dispatch the call out. Stay tuned, Time's Up will be right back after this. Coming up next on Time's Up, we visit the recycling center in Waterloo and learn why we need to recycle. And we join for supper at community ministry that prepares meals for the homeless. We build a safe place where people feel that they belong. Climate change is one of the biggest problems we are facing today. However, we can prevent it from getting worse. And managing waste is the first step. So let's learn how to save our planet. I'm Mary Jane Patterson, and I'm the Executive Director at Reap Green Solutions. We're an environmental charity, and very simply, we help people live sustainably. Could you explain what the Zero Waste Challenge is and how it can actually help the environment? The Zero Waste Challenge is a challenge we put out to the community to see if you can keep all of the waste that would otherwise go to landfill in a mason jar for one week. And the way it can benefit the environment is to really wake us all up to the amount of waste we give off or that we create in our daily lives and really start thinking about how we can reduce that. Recycling is two things. It's as simple as an action where we're putting something into the blue box, but it's also so much more. It's the beginning of a process. It's how we get things ready to change into new things. We may change how they look, how they feel, even how they're used. Why should we recycle? Why should we recycle? Because it's easy. Anyone and everyone can do it. Not only do we decrease our waste, but we also increase our environmental sustainability in the region of Ontario. When recycling started, we only had a very few set of items that were going into the blue box. But nowadays, a lot can go in. And with that comes a little bit more complexity. Ideally, we'd be sorting at home, and then again by our collectors at the curb, and then again here at our materials recycling center named after Niall Ludolf, who's actually the father of the blue box. Whether it's using the blue box or the green bin to the full advantage, we'll do a lot for increasing the impact our recycling can have. So if you have any questions about waste, waste management, or any of our services, or how you can do more, please check out our webpage. You can find out tips and tricks there, as well as all sorts of handy information. Thanks so much for your time, John. Thank you. Sometimes a warm meal can feed the hearts of those who don't have a roof over their heads. I visited a community ministry at St. Mark's Lutheran Church who serves meals every Wednesday for the past 21 years and learned how we can help those in need. The most important thing about community ministry is building community. We build a safe place where people feel that they belong, they're not judged, um, they're not preached to, <laughs> even though I'm a preacher. Um, they are just welcomed as they are. Um, we uh, cultivate a culture of uh, kindness and respect, and as long as people follow that, they're welcome here in this space. And so building community is about listening to people, finding out what their needs are. If I'm not able to help them, I can direct them to other agencies in the city who can help them. Uh, a lot of times people just want to feel that they're being heard, that they have a voice. 
and so we do a lot of listening, and um, and that's important. How long have you attended here? I say about maybe four years now, but it's been a while, and I love it. I really do. I'm coming here now. How has this, um, as you've attended and also volunteered here, how has this been beneficial for you? Very good because it gives me a purpose to do something every Wednesday. I know sometimes I come when I'm sick, but I love coming here. And, and I, I got to meet new people here too. And I just want to say all these people who do the meals and that, they are beautiful. Absolutely. And I thank God for them all. At Community Ministry, we like to um, offer our, our members that come in to eat a little bit better than what an average soup kitchen would be like. During our meal time, uh, during that community building time, we have volunteers who come out on the floor and talk to the people that come in for support, and we, we make friends. Stay with us, we'll be right back after this. Coming up next on Time's Out. Students share how they overcome racial discrimination. It's much better than the United States racism. That doesn't happen here, but it does. And we join Skate Able that helps kids with special needs skate on the ice. I think Skate Able is an incredible organization. It's something unique that not a lot of people know exists or have access to even participate in, which I think is really important. Happiness is not defined by color, religion, or ethnicity. And I was able to talk to a few students at the University of Waterloo who want to inspire, educate, and empower our community to eradicate the negative impacts of racial discrimination. I am part of Bring on the Sunshine, which is a festival that takes place every year on Family Day in Kitchener City Hall. Basically, our whole idea is to bring a taste of Africa to the city of Kitchener-Waterloo. And it's just a really fun atmosphere. We have performances as well, face painting, all kinds of things that you could think of. So initially it started with Jackie Terry and Alice and a bunch of different people in the Zimbabwean community who just really wanted to see uh, African, Africans come together and initially party. We're a team of, there are men on the team, but it's mostly women who can really make something happen. Um, and that being said, there are so many black men in our society too that do so much work. Uh, but just to see like the different networks that are forming, slowly but surely we're making headway and we're making, we're making movements. First year that I realized I was black because I'm also from um, from abroad. I'm Canadian, but like I grew up back home in Rwanda. And so coming here, being referred to as the black girl, I was like, wait a minute. I looked at my hand and I was like, I'm black. What does that mean? There are people that come to us. There are incidents that happen. First year, she told us about an experience that she had where she was called a slave. Some other one time she was walking and uh, she was called the N-word. I went in grade eight, I was the only black person, but it was still different than when I was in kindergarten and people would ask me, oh, do you go to huts? Like, do you live in huts? Like, it was, it was more of an awareness. That really encouraged me to step out and be more active in my community. People associate Canada as a utopia. Even my other friends who moved from Egypt, they thought, oh, Canada is a utopia. It's much better than the United States racism. That doesn't happen here, but it does. We're really, really, really grateful for everything, all the freedoms that we have here. And we want to keep that going, which is why we want this to be addressed. Kids with disabilities deserve to have fun like any other kid and be involved with sports and activities. We visit Skate Able, a program that gives kids the opportunity to skate and connect. I think Skate Able is an incredible organization. It's something unique that not a lot of people know exists or have access to even participate in, which I think is really important. As someone who like grew up very much in the skating community and my brother played hockey, I think skating is one of those like quintessential life skills that you learn as a Canadian kid growing up. Because of the fact that we can like provide, 
the expertise and the assistance and even the equipment for kids with disabilities to be able to learn how to skate, I think provides them just with the opportunity to hang out with friends and to do more things that maybe they don't necessarily get to do if they didn't have these programs. So definitely recommend it to anyone who's like considering it. You get to work with an amazing group of kids, an amazing group of people, and at the end of the day, it's an hour. It's not that much to put into volunteer either. The way that we pair for the entire eight-week program with the same coach. So we say on the first session, you know, don't even really worry about skating abilities and skating skills. Just focus on creating a positive mentorship relationship with your child and they will open up as the weeks come. So that's the key to being out there. And for the, those that struggle with socialization in their everyday lives, they have a little safety net. They have a buddy that's always there that they know cares about them and that allows them to go out and be a little bit more outgoing and step outside their comfort zone. I've had a variety of experiences with the kids that I've taught that have ranged um, just from their ability levels to kind of the progress they've made and so it's been really exciting and interesting kind of watching them grow and I guess it's kind of surprising in a way just to seeing the differences that occur within kids and within how even their conditions change over time. We deal with a group of kids that don't get to participate in recreation and sport very often, don't get to participate in group activities, they're often in special education programs, and so they just don't get a chance to socialize, to play, to have fun, and that's what brings meaning and purpose to their lives. So it's really joyous to see them, even the ones that have you know, sensory perception disabilities, are on the autistic spectrum, that struggle with socialization, to see them opening up. Parents will be um, excited by their improvements. Uh, even if it's you know, a child been anxious and afraid and so, uh, struggling with separation anxiety from parents, when they start participating in the games, uh, laughing and playing and walking on the ice. Um, those are big steps, even though uh, in other people's worlds they might be seen as small victories. We celebrate small victories all the time. Um, or something like, you know, a child uh, is distracted by Simon Says and that gets them to stop holding on and then they realize they can skate without holding on and they're no longer afraid. So parents certainly see that. Um, and of course that's a great experience for them too. I think a lot of parents are just like excited to see the growth in their kid and to see them learn a new skill and to try something new. The fact that we have the equipment that allows them to learn, I think parents really enjoy. And it's nice that they can like do something with their kid after school and they see their kid grow and progress each week and or each session or each year as the kid gets better. We've seen kids go off and play hockey or go into figure skating and so I definitely think the parents are really enjoying it, which I think is all a parent can really ask for their kid how joyous it is working with the kids. I have so many stories because I've gotten to work with a bunch of different kids, which normally the volunteers are paired with the same child for an entire eight week period. I've kind of been a floater. I think I've realized how much the kids teach me and how much the coaches come from all different backgrounds and they teach me and how much I enjoy the shared learning experience and that everyone is really out here to better these kids' lives, and this is a real opportunity to do that. That ends our episode of Time's Up. I hope you learned about the different social issues that we've covered and how to be part of the change. I'm Rudy Nocturne, and thank you so much for watching.